Hey guys, it's Bailey Wiki, and uh, okay, so so check this out. We're um, we're using the new Circus and Carnival release that just hit today. It should be April third, twenty twenty four. By the time you watch this, and I have this starting template for a circus or a fairground or something, right? And you can kind of see token here, the general like size and dimensions of this. Okay, so this scene is not ready yet. I have a bunch of space in the middle that I can, I can put stuff into. So, okay. Uh -oh. So first let's, uh, let's look at how the scene looks like at night. Drop the lights. Okay. I've got a bunch of lights that came on, but they're, they're pretty harsh. So what if I grab one of these and I hit shift F I'm using the mass edit module here, and that's going to be the topic of what we discussed today. So I'm going to search for this color light. I'm going to say search and edit, and I want to give all of these lights a flicker. And then I also want to give them all some attenuation. Let's add a little bit of saturation and contrast while we're at it. Yeah, this looks good. We'll hit apply. Aha, great. Got some nice flickering lights. This is already pretty good. All right, so next, what if I wanted to add a few, I don't know, like barrels and crates around here? Turn the lights back on. Got a random barrel. Let's use this. And we're going to use this new paintbrush thing. Notice it's like painting in like barrels, right? So maybe we want to just, you know, throw some of these, I don't know, around this, uh, this merchant tent. This is more than barrels. You can see it's sort of randomly picking from different kinds of artwork, right? But I'm just placing barrels in. Maybe I even do some of these, some of these colored barrels, because this is a, a circus or a carnival, right? Now let's drop in a couple of tents. Jump back here to our token placeables and we see a bunch of tents. Check this out. So this is new. You guys haven't seen this before yet. And we'll rotate this tent around. Uh, you know what, we'll even resize it, make it like nice and big. We'll drop it in right here, All right? Notice we're in this tent. If I double click it, you can change the interior. Yeah, maybe I'll put something in here later. And let's drop in something like a fortune teller. Maybe right there. This one's colored purple. It doesn't have to be. Okay, this is good. Now, I feel like we need a couple of wagons. So maybe we'll jump, drop in like this, like this kind of cool looking wagon. Then maybe we want um, something else that's kind of, I don't know, circusy. That works. And then let's drop in a couple of like vendor wagons. So I'm going to double click. And maybe there's a vendor wagon over here. And another one right there. Maybe there's something in my story that these something can happen in one of these wagons. I'm gonna double click these wagons to kind of randomize them. It's randomizing not only the, the top but the interior, making it look like maybe yeah, they're like selling something. There they are, vendors here. It's pretty good. Now maybe I want a couple torches. Grab some of these. Yeah, put one in front of this. I like that. 
and then I'm going to look up canopy. I'm going to look it up under tiles here, and I find random canopy with rotation. Let's use this. Let's brush it on. Go to our green brush, and maybe I'll put a canopy here, and a couple around here. You dress it up around the. Yeah, maybe there's some like benders sitting outside some of these. Yeah, I like that. And okay, let's check out how we did. Yeah, we've got the start of a pretty good story here. I can walk under these, or I can make it so they they don't occlude at all. I can go inside these wagons see what the vendors are selling pretty good there's a blacksmith okay so we just used mass edit and you can see we built a scene pretty quickly and we used mass edits asset browser so that's what we're going to explore today is the preset browser of mass edit this is bailey wiki mass edit it's new to the family but it's been around a long time i've been talking about mass edit for quite a while um you may not subscribe to my map content so apologies in advance as this video is primarily to help my subscribers find and use my prefab content but even if you don't subscribe to me there's lots of new features of mass edit that you'll want to know about that module is free so all the things i just showed you the functionality is free and it does lots of other things and i promise you'll get a ton of inspiration from this and how you can use presets and prefabs in foundry there's also some new features that are new uh, to mass edit that you're going to want to know about today and if you're a content creator yourself for foundry you might imagine how you could leverage mass edit for your own clever Foundry creations. And remember that everything in here is going to be timestamped. So if you're using this as a reference, feel free to set the playback speed to one and a half X and jump around as you like. Uh, so yes, this is everything you need to know about using the, the giant collection of BaileyWiki prefabs. There's almost 3000 of them today. And this is as of April, 2024. So also keep in mind, you'll see subtle changes or even big changes in the particulars about how this works, depending on how many months later you're watching this. So we are actively developing BaileyWiki mass edit as we speak, and we will be making lots and lots of changes in, in some of which you'll see today. Also, we won't go into creating prefabs in this tutorial. That's a whole area of fun and productivity for GMs. We're just gonna cover how to use prefabs today. Honestly, once you start using it, it'll be pretty intuitive how you create them as well. And I have other tutorials on Mass Edit. You can search my channel for Mass Edit and see those. So first off, you need the free BaileyWiki modules and, and specifically our utility modules, right? So Mass Edit and then Nuts and Bolts. Nuts and Bolts just stores macros that will make certain interactions work. And it also contains a special compendium for some of my presets, specifically the, the non-token based presets. So you just need to have it installed and it'll work. And if you have 3D Canvas, Mass Edit also works with 3D as well, although we don't have nearly as many prefabs in that system, but you can make prefabs presets um, in 3D Canvas too. You'll also need Token Attacher. This is a module that actually powers the, pre, the prefab creation itself. And to maximize all the content, you'll want modules like Levels, Multi-Face Tiles, Monk's Active Tile Triggers, Tagger, and also Token Magic Effects. I'll link to all of these in the video description. And you can jump ahead to see where and how we use them. Okay, so in terms of mass edit, that is the delivery mechanism for prefabs and presets. It doesn't just let you, uh, you know, edit everything on the screen like you saw me do with those those lights recently, or edit very specific things and like laser target with a scalpel, how you make edits of entities on the screen. But it also has this uh, preset browser, and it's just a really snappy browser. It indexes all of the content that you might want to uh, be trying to get to. And it even has those special asset brushes and things that you saw me brush here a second ago and even more functionality than, than I even showed you. And again, while it does a lot more, we won't cover that today. We're just going to cover the asset browser. So the way you get to it is once you install Mass Edit, you have this blue um, icon over here that opens up your asset browser. So once you have them installed, just make sure this little toggle is clicked on to display external compendiums, and you will see any external compendiums that apply to any of these categories here down below. 
Once those are active, you can see everything under the All tab and you can just start searching for things. Like bushes, right? Different prefabs and other things around bushes. Here's a paintbrush that lets you paint, brush, paint bushes on a scene and it automatically gives them this autumn hue. Anything that's a token based prefab, meaning token attacher was used to build it or it itself is a token, you can find here. But I also have a lot of tile-based prefabs that you can find. Um, they have different types of things attached to them, like they might use levels or they might use token magic effects and other things. So you can find them here as well. And you can make lots of prefabs. Like I have prefabs for how I do my labeling in scenes. I have prefabs for how I do special walls, right? I have like a flesh door that has a flesh sound to it. I have a light blocking. I have a proximity walls that are hard to remember. And so I just make prefabs out of them and then I can paint a wall with those settings or I can just drop them in. I have prefabs for how I like to do my scene lighting, whether they're lights that are always on, whether it's a torch glow, whether you know it's going to have the actual torch flame in it, things like that. And then I have prefabs for how I do my audio. Like I have prefabs for just dragging out like if I want an all day ambient audio sound, I can drag it out onto the scene. And then I can go in and change that to something else, but it has the settings to basically fill the scene and make sure that it's always on during the day and night. Whereas other ones, I only want to come on at nighttime, for example. So I use those a lot when I'm building scenes really quickly. You can also, if you just find yourself always opening up to the prefabs or you want to open up to all, you can have it automatically do that every time. You can also have it automatically switch your layers when you're working on the prefabs. That can be helpful. I leave mine on. Uh, you also probably want to leave this on, but you can play around in situations where you don't. This is just make sure that everything that you're dropping drops into the grid size. So if I made something in your Bailiwiki content, you're probably going to want to leave this on because it's meant to scale whatever that thing is to the grid size that you're working with. Next up, you can search. So if you toggle this on to actually search the folders, then as you type, and you type the word like building, for example, you'll get all of the buildings uh, to, and you'll pick them up whether they're in a folder that says buildings, whether it says building as a keyword or whether it says building as a tag. And we have a new tagging system. So like if you wanted to see all the new content, you type in new and you can see all the new stuff that came out in the recent release. Right. And there's quite a bit of it. And also with the search, it is a fuzzy search. So you can search for things like orc and tent, and it will produce anything that has the word orc and the word tent in it, even if they're out of order. I really like this bistro. You can actually change this. It's colorable, so you can change it to different colors. So if we get rid of that one and we want to make it like white, for example. We have this bistro set of bistro chairs. I love it. So what are prefabs and presets? Well, they're just pre-built entities, right? That have certain settings and um, attributes already applied. They can also just be like sets of settings and not even like a tile or something like that. It's so anything that you want to pre-build or if anything you built that you want to reuse later. And it can even pull settings from special modules like levels or multi-phase tiles or monks active tile triggers, really any modules out there that save their flags to an entity, you can use those within these prefabs and presets. So you can really just basically design anything in Foundry. Um, and if you like it, you can instantly reuse it later uh, just by dragging and dropping or painting it onto assets or, or dropping them in with the brush. And it's way more expansive and powerful than you might initially imagine. So I'll give you some more examples as we go. We'll also be working on showing you how to look for past releases. Right now we're just using a tagging system. So 2024-04, that's the recent release. You'll see that if you hover over, you'll see there's tags associated with these. And it, the search will also search for the tag. We haven't gone back in time yet, so this tag's only working from now forward, but we may add those later. And we'll probably have a, a refine the system for how you look for past releases. So as you saw, to place a prefab, you can just like literally drag it out. Right, here's an artificer wagon. Uh, but you can also double click and that opens up this preview mode. And while you're in preview mode, 
you can rotate it around. So I'm holding shift to rotate uh, at large increments. Now I'm holding control to rotate in small increments. And then I'm holding alt and that will scale it up and down. Now it does not scale the height of the walls just by design, just because we didn't want walls to be like a hundred feet tall by accident. Um, but it scales everything with the prefab, as you can see. Now, the one caveat here is this does require a forked version. As of, as of the time of this recording, there's a forked version of Token Attacher. I'm going to link to it in the description. You need that to make this work this way. This will all work with the current version. If you tried it, this will work. But when you place it, uh, if you don't use the forked version of Token Attacher, then you have to move this token once and it'll resize everything the way that you anticipated it. So that might look a little clunky for some of you. So I recommend using the forked version. By the time you're seeing this, it may already be implemented. KLG may already have pushed the uh, updated code that we sent him. Um, but that's that's how you get these prefabs to resize like you just saw. And that's just with token attacher. That's where you have like these prefabs that have this handle on them, right? That I can move around and and then all of the attachments of the prefab, the walls, the lights, and the tiles, they all move around with it. If you're just using any of the other presets, you don't have to worry about it. It's all natively done with token attacher. So like this bistro table, you just drop that in. Notice it doesn't have a handle on it to move it um, because it's not a prefab. It's not made with the token attacher. It's just uh, tiles that are associated together into a single entity. Now, while you have preview mode enabled, you can exit out of it by pressing the center mouse wheel, and that will get you out of preview mode and back into the window. Also, if you're using the token-based prefabs and you've got levels active on your scene, so you see I've got a scene here and levels is active, and I've got only one level here, um, turn this off. If you ever drop a prefab into a scene that has levels enabled, while this is active, it'll force all of the attachments and occlusion modes and other things into whatever your settings are for levels. And you actually don't want that. These prefabs are already made with all those settings already set. So if you drop it in while levels UI is active, it will it will make the prefab perform um, or, or behave not as intended. So while it's not active, I can drop this in and everything works great. You can see I've got wall height. Um, my occlusion mode is uh, set to always visible so it doesn't go away so anyway keep that in mind when you're using prefabs just turn off levels we'll go into token attacher based prefabs here at a later timestamp in more detail okay next you have the brush tool and you've seen there's two different modes so we'll show you mode number one so we're going to go to our bushes in this case we want to repaint these bushes a different color we're going to do like this dry bush so we're going to click it once and it becomes yellow. And then we're going to start clicking these bushes. And you can see it's giving them this dry color, right? So maybe something that we might use in a desert. And then we can maybe go to green color. Right? Whereas if we click it again and make it green, that will actually spawn these entities. Now be really careful. You don't want to have so many tiles on your screen that you like kill your performance. And we'll talk about if you're gonna make like huge tile-based maps, how to optimize performance at the end. But you know, don't just like put a thousand of these things on your on your map in a really large map, right? You're gonna to wanna to go with a smaller map, fewer tiles if you're gonna start spamming them around. And you can use the same thing for things like lights, right? So if I wanted my chroma light and I start clicking on these lights, it will give them that setting, right? By the way, these are uh, presets and they're locked. That's why they're not taking the inputs. We'll talk about that when we get to that section. So that's how the these presets work. Like if you have walls and you wanted to make a proximity wall and you forgot how to do it, just make it, set it up once, and then you can just paint this onto your walls. You can even just drag it around. And as it intersects with the wall, it'll change it. Cool, right? Okay, so the next thing you need to know is that you need certain modules 
to power certain kinds of prefabs and presets. Like that's the whole magic of these things, right? You can have super complex multi-story ships with working teleports and monks active tile triggers and token magic effects visuals and all these ambient sounds and to save it all into a little tiny Pokemon ball that you can throw onto a canvas at any time, right? So the first thing you want to know about is token attacher. Token attacher is used for token-based presets, right? So things like this, where you have a where you have a token that is a handle for the prefab and you can move it around your scene. So you need to understand token attacher module to be able to be a prefab expert. And there's kind of four things you need to know. The first one is you need to understand the token attacher locks attachments and prefabs. Once part of the prefab, you can't click them or edit them. See, I'm trying to interact with this and I can't actually interact easily with any of these, these attachments because they're locked. So to, to manipulate them, you need to temporarily unlock the prefab first. And you need to do that with what's called quick edit mode. So you can activate quick edit mode either through the UI or, or my preferred method, this handy quick edit macro here. You can get this in my nuts and bolts. See, so just toggled on quick edit. And now I can interact with all of these attachments and I can change them. So I can make changes. You can see here when I turn on quick edit mode, I can make changes and then as exit quick edit mode and everything locks back in place again. You can also open quick edit mode here. There's a little easy button off of the token controls that will turn on quick edit mode for you, but I find it's easy just to put it in my macro bar, especially during a build session. The next thing you need to know, like if you want to like add attachments to an existing prefab or make your own prefabs, you need to understand the, the token attacher UI. And you can find that here under this chain link, right? It lets you grab lots of things all together. Right, I can add all of these things to my my preset. Um, you can attach things individually here or unattach them. You can delete all of the attachments. Like when you're finally ready to just release the prefab entirely, you don't want to maintain its its lock status. You can release them entirely. You can also lock and unlock specific um, entities. So I can uh, unlock this top. And then when I want to interact with it later, you can see it can actually interact with it to some degree. I can open it up. That's because it's unlocked. So it gives me a little bit of control even while I haven't unlocked the preset or the prefab. And you also do some other helpful things like just turning on the uh, animation for, or turning on and off the animation for, for prefab tokens. This is a token, but you see it just jumps from spot to spot. That's because it's token animations turned off. So I don't have to sit there and wait for the, control token to, to crawl across the screen, right? It's helpful when you're working with prefabs. Third thing you want to know is about all the handy macros. So there's there's some macros that I use a lot, um, like deleting all control tokens. If you use that macro, it'll delete all these little tokens and it'll release all your prefabs on the entire scene. So you can see my scene's got all these control tokens around them. Well, when I'm ready, and these, these are invisible to players, right? Even this torch has the control token. When I'm ready, I can release all of them and it will release everything. And now I can move everything around. You're, you can't undo that. So you want to wait until you're happy with your scene first. Also, if you ever place a prefab and it starts acting wonky on you, it might be because when you placed it, you started trying to move it too soon. And it, it, prefabs do take a, a second to like code and like sort of get themselves ready in the scene. If you ever do that and you find you have a prefab you can't manipulate anymore or it's attachment state on the screen and you can't touch them, just delete all the missing links and that will delete that stuff off of your scene and you can you can do it over again. And of course, your quick edit mode is also another one you'll find helpful. And the last thing you need to know, of course, is that there are other modules at play when you drop in these prefabs, right? It's the reason why this bistro table turned you know purple when i dropped it in there's other modules that can power these things so first off is levels so anytime you have a building or anything that's got like an overhead tile these buildings typically have levels uh, coded into them so if i drag this building out real simple little building you see it's got this like wooden roof and that roof occludes and it's got wall height. This is all based on levels coding, right? So if you drop in a building that has level stuff, you're gonna want it, uh, you're gonna wanna make sure that you have the levels UI turned off, right? This is on, now it's off because um, like I said before, it will try to recode everything in some weird way, right? So here we just dropped like a little shack in the middle of our, our carnival. All of these tents 
and other things have levels data in them. And of course, when I say levels, you've got wall height, you've got better roofs. These are all part of the same sort of family of rippers and kind of levels based modules that are all free. And as always, remember to turn on quick edit mode once you drop something in, if you want to make any adjustments to how it's, how it's coded. Okay, next is multi-face tiles. And if we search for the word multi, we will find all of these presets that have multi-face tiles enabled. Okay, so let's drag one out and see um, what we mean by this. Uh, why don't we just use one of these wagons? So when it says multi, it means there's something on the wagon that if you right click it, you get all of these other options. So here I can look for other kinds of tops for my, for my wagon, right? And so when it says that you're going to want to look for either a foreground tile or background tile that has the, the multi face tiles enabled. It's just a simple module by freeze RPG. Even this bistro table is multi face tiles enabled, right? It's also colorable. You'll notice it's colors changing as I cycle through these, but you can change. You can even change these chair types, right? The seating itself is even multi-face tile enabled. The next one is monks active tiles. And the way we designate that is with the term mat. Mat just means that there's something smart about the thing that you just dropped in. There's something automated about it. And you, when you drop things in like this wagon, for example, is multi-face tile enabled. Let's open it up, go to triggers, and we can see that if the GM double clicks it, then it changes the tile image. So let's try that. I'm a GM, I'm double clicking, and it's cycling randomly through the tile image. When I showed you earlier this vendor thing, this actually has two multi face or uh, monks active tiles. The overhead and the uh, tile underneath both have the ability to change. So if I click on the background tile, I go to triggers, I can see if the GM double clicks it, it'll randomize that image as well as the foreground tile. So I'm technically clicking two different tiles and it's just randomizing their images. But I can also say, hey, look, I like that top tile. This one, maybe I want to change or maybe I just want to delete it and just be left with the wagon underneath. If I drop in prefabs or, um, facades like this my and i double click the the fire i can also like just see that there's matte on those as well the next one you want is token magic effects and not everything is marked with token magic effects but many of them are token magic effects creates visual effects if i wanted the organic pool you know, the tadpole pool from one of my last releases, the brine pool. These are token magic effects that create this. If I didn't have token magic effects installed, you wouldn't see this animated effect here. It would look like a, uh, just a regular tile. Here, token magic effects is making this ball hover above these hands. In this statue, Token Magic Effects is applying this, this stone effect on top of the tile. And while this is a bad room to, to drop it into, this room has Token Magic Effects that cause this like fire concept down below. Now, if we use the term colorable, we're really talking about an asset that is going to be um, sort of red at its base. Right. So like this, you know, this tent is, is really technically colorable, right? Let's drop in this, this tree here. Now this has multi-face tiles enabled. And if I right click it, you can see, I can find a red version of the tree. If I want that tree to be something like a orange color, I can do that. It's colorable using this dungeon draft overlay filter. If I've got mass edit installed, I can hit shift E and I can get to that same filter in this way, right? If I want a purple tree, I apply it here. I've got a purple tree. So this is multi-face tiles enabled and it's colorable, right? And anything that has red pixels is colorable. So if I want this to change the color of this tent, I can do that. Say I want a green tent, just change it to green. 
this tent, for example, if I delete the token magic effect filter, by the way, these are all macros you can find in nuts and bolts. If I delete the filter, it goes back to red. So you can see it dropped in already as colorable or with the color already encoded. Now with all the stuff, we have some really cool things coming out. So keep an eye on uh, other sort of advanced filters and things that we can now do with the mass edit system. So just a few final tips. When you're all done with the scene, you can use the token attacher, delete all control tokens that will delete all of the control tokens, releasing all the prefabs and making everything editable. And then another step you can do after that, if you've got a crazy scene, like this is a lot going on in this scene, um, lots of tiles, we can actually optimize this for gameplay. If you, if you have media optimizer, which is free from Ripper, and if you're using Ripper's VTT client, you can come in here to your tile controls, media optimizer, and you can take all your background tiles and including the background itself and make a single image out of it, right? You can back up and combine this, make a single image. It'll flatten the entire image uh, um, stuff that you have here. Uh, you can just go with selected tiles, just foreground. Um, and you can basically, you know, code all of these things uh, so that they're a single tile together. It'll make things super efficient for gameplay. Another thing you might want to know about also in tile controls is you can go to tile sort. And if you are on background tile, it'll show you all the background tiles that are now on the scene and you can rearrange them. You can move certain things over or under and it'll change the Z order in case you have tiles hiding underneath other tiles. In case you're trying to get to this, you know, tent for the, the tent interior to code something, you can do that really easily just by finding it with tile sort. If I switch over to my foreground tiles, it'll show me all the foreground tiles that are active on the scene as well. And you can see, you can, you can move them around, you can move them in groups. You can hit shift E, which is mass edit. Once you have them selected, you can make changes to the ones that you want. So tile sort is another really helpful module. So as you guys can see, there's a lot, there's a lot here and really flexible, really easy to find them, search them, place them down on your maps. Let me know how you get along, what kinds of enhancements you could see us making to this system going forward. I'm really excited about it. It's never been easier to use our content, to throw it into a map and you know make a campsite just super quickly. In the meantime, thanks everybody for all your support of the channel. Thank you to our Patreons for helping us uh, continue to build this kind of stuff to make being a DM easier and more fun to release the inner tinker 